Hello, this is Gary Fox here, and tonight I'm going to continue with the blog post that I did. And that means those of you that are watching the video, uh, there was a previous blog post that I did not create a video for. And that blog post had a uh, podcast, and then it also had another video embedded in it. Not one that I created, but one that was on the same subject by a guy that knows a whole lot more than what I know. Uh, anyhow, uh, what I want to talk about is has to do with projects and processes. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about diagramming processes. So as you diagram them, you can start trying to determine what's important and what's not so you can kind of figure out your projects that are going to be related to it. So, the process that we're going to talk about is growing plants, growing plants for food. And uh, we're going to talk about that first with this diagram that I have on the screen right now. This diagram is a type of diagram called a fishbone diagram. It's what most Americans call it. It's an Ishikawa diagram is the uh, real name. It was invented in Japan when they were doing... Uh, when they were really improving their quality control. And uh, it was taught in America at the time. We were also trying to improve our quality, which I guess Ford has done a really good job on. Uh, and, you know, Japan, Honda, and Toyota were eating our lunch. So uh, <laughs> the American car companies had to get their act together or at least Ford did. I'm not so sure about the other American car companies. But anyway, we'll get off that subject. So what we're doing on this diagram, you see at the left, we got our input, which is a seed. And then at the output is what, where the arrowheads goes. And uh, you see our goal is to get some food, or the fruit of the uh, plant, if it's a tomato plant, for instance, or a cucumber, or whatever kind of plant we're going to grow. So we have inputs that are necessary to, to get that seed to grow. Seeds grow naturally out in the environment. It's just us some people, we try to help them along. And uh, when seeds go in the environment, there's like thousands of seeds on a plant. And then uh, only one or two of those are going to take off next year. So the odds are not too good in the particular seed's favor. So we help it along to try to improve those odds. And then maybe sometimes our help is not as good as we'd like to think it is. And that's where we're heading. So anyhow, that seed lands on the ground. And then it requires a temperature. There's a range. And the seed won't germinate until it, when it's cold. And then uh, as it gets the earth warms up, it creates a warm temperature that causes the seed to grow, to uh, open up. And the seed gets water. And that seed then starts sprouting into a little plant. The uh, seedling uh, grows and then eventually it sets roots down into the earth. As those roots go reach down into the earth, they grab nutrients from the earth. And also the roots anchor the plant into a particular place so it doesn't just blow around. And then within the earth, there's pores within that earth. The earth is somewhat porous. And what that does is that provides air that's in the earth. And the air and the water play with each other as it rains. It fills up those pores, and then as the plant and the water drains, either because it just drains down further into the earth, or as the plant starts consuming it, the water is replaced by air, and uh, those roots need both the air and the water. That's how a common way that people kill house plants is that they overwater them, and basically the uh, roots die of being drowned. So, all of that's important. 
with the water. You have a pH combination in nature with the pH of the water and the earth. And uh, that affects what nutrients can be taken up into the plant. And uh, it's real important when you start getting into what I'm doing right now, which is uh, hydroponics. But you have a pH. And uh, I'm noticing right now that the pH of rainwater, or at least rainwater in my rain barrels, which may, and we'll get into that a little bit, there may be some uh, material rotting inside that rain barrel. Basically leaves and stuff that have been up on the roof that have then got washed into the barrel. But the pH of that is very acidic. Uh, I think the pH of rain by itself is very acidic here. Uh, used to be a thing that people talked about a lot, acid rain. You don't hear so much about that anymore. Okay, uh, the temperature changes with the time as the plant grows. Usually it sprouts in the spring, and then as the days get longer, they get hotter. And uh, that is a real problem with what I have to fight here with uh, trying to grow a garden. So I've just about reached the limit of time that my cold weather plants, which are my green plants, like lettuce and stuff, can actually grow. And pretty soon they're going to start uh, saying, hey, it's too hot. They'll do what they call bolting, which means that they'll form seed pods. And uh, then they'll no longer be any good for me to use as food. So you have to kind of figure out a way to cope with that. And that's going to be some future experiments. We'll talk a little bit about that probably in the next video or blog. I'm not real sure how I'm going to do it. Okay, the air... Air is really important to plants because they need oxygen and they need carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide is one of the things taken up along with the water and then sunlight. And that's why how plants make sugar is with a process called photosynthesis. And sorry about my pronunciation of that. But uh, that's how the plants take up the... Uh, create sugar from sunlight and water and that's how we are able to eat the plants to get some nourishment out of them. But the plants also have to uh, use some of that nourishment themselves so they also require oxygen both on their leaves and in the, uh, the roots. And uh, they basically do the same thing that we do which the word fails me at the moment. <laughs> but they basically have to consume some of that sugar that they, they, uh, that they create. We just happen to rip them off of most of the sugar when we're eating the, the food. The plants do that willingly. And uh, so that's basically kind of a fishbone diagram to des describe what happens to a seed and how it turns into food for us. There are a couple of waste items that come out of that. Uh, or at least we consider them a waste. And that is the excess oxygen, which is a really nice thing since uh, we need it to breathe. To do respiration, which is the word I happened to forget a few minutes ago. And that's how we uh, generate energy to allow our bodies to uh, move and to basically live. And then there's the unused plant parts. And those unused plant parts, at least to us, what those do eventually they get, they return back to earth. And uh, so those parts basically decompose, come back to earth. And if we're smart, we use those and put them in a compost pile so that we make new earth to uh, reuse some of those nutrients that the plants had before. We also use the carbon in there, allows the earth to become more porous and better hold the water, better hold the nutrients if we're adding outside nutrients by adding fertilizers. So that's basically the plant's requirements and it can get a whole lot more detailed. For instance, nutrients, there's a whole lot of nutrients uh, 
different types of nutrients that the plant requires. Different plants require a different pH range. And uh, a lot of plants, for instance, potatoes, if you let potatoes get into a basic uh, pH, in other words, a pH that's greater than 7, uh, they tend to get diseased. Most plants prefer a little bit of acidic uh, pH. And I'm finding that out right now. They don't require the pH that's in the range of my rainwater. <laughs> uh, most of them require a pH somewhere between 5.5 and 6.5. 7 is considered uh, neutral. And uh, my rainwater is coming in at like 5 or maybe even 4. So I'm having to modify the rainwater that I'm using to put on my... Uh, hydroponics plants okay well that's basically with a, a plant now if we're going to go to a uh, an idea that I had what I originally was intended on doing if you have fish and you feed fish food the fish create a waste I didn't draw a complete fishbone diagram here. I'm drawing more now just a simple diagram. But the fish create waste, but the fish can provide food. So you can eat the meat of the fish. Okay, plants require nutrients, and then the plants obviously provide food, as our previous fishbone diagram. But what if the plants were to use the nutrients that the fish produce, and then the plants would clean the water, which could then go back to the fish, and you could have an almost complete cycle right there. And the only input would be fish food, and the, only, and the output would be two different kinds of food here, plant and animal. That sounded really good. Matter of fact, I ended up with a great big tank. Got it for free. Uh, something called an IBC tote, which is about a 275 gallon tank. And I was going to uh, look at going directly into this. Okay, with plants, with growing fish by themselves is called aquaculture. Growing plants with just using water is called hydroponics. And combining the two is called aquaponics. And uh, man, that sounds like a really good idea. But, like all good ideas, as you start looking into the technical parts, uh, the great ideas start to uh, get complicated. So as I looked at that, okay, well, to get from the fish waste to nutrients, uh, there is another whole process that's involved. One of those is that the plants, the fish produce two kinds of waste, liquid waste and solid waste. The liquid waste is ammonia. It's basically the same things that us humans produce as far as our waste. Uh, but the fish do it a little differently. Uh, one of them is ammonia, which comes out of the gills of the fish. And that's from their respiration breaking down uh, proteins. The other is there's solid waste, which can either be from overfeeding the fish, and it's just basically fish food going to the bottom, or it could be basically fish manure going to the bottom of the uh, tank. One tends to go to the bottom, and the other one tends to float, although the manure can float around also. So you're going to be uptaking that. Okay, there are bacteria that take the liquid waste. Those bacteria then take that liquid waste and they uh, turn it from ammonia into some nitrates and into nitrites. Maybe the other way around because I get those two mixed up. And then that become, can become the nutrients for the plants. The plants then uptake that so you got clean water heading back toward the fish. The solid waste is a little bit more of a problem. The solid waste tends to gum everything up. 
depending upon how many fish you have, which is one of the problems that I worried about. So, for home use when you're doing aquaculture, you don't put near as many fish in there for the amount of plants that you're going to grow or for the amount of area that you're growing the plants in. And then uh, what they do, most people have worms that are also inside that, that area. And the worms are uh, consuming that solid waste and turn it into a little less bad solid waste called worm casings. And the plants will uptake that and so they get more nutrients out of it. So uh, that's, that is it. Okay, now the bacteria. Remember all the things we had in that fishbone diagram. We had temperatures. We had pH. We had a lot of things. Well, there's ranges for the pH for the fish. There's also temperatures that the fish like. And there's ranges for the plants. Temperatures for the plants that they like. But these bacteria also have ranges that they like. Now, bacteria are small microorganisms. So it takes a whole lot of them to uh, do the job that you need done. And they don't, they reproduce quickly, but not that quickly. So that's one of the big rubs that I had with trying to go with aquaponics is that the bacteria takes about a month before it all grows good enough that you have enough in there that you cr can create your uh, you can filter out the liquid waste from the fish. So it takes a little bit of time to grow the bacteria. So the problem is the bacteria needs a temperature, a fairly warm temperature to grow. Uh, when it gets too hot, that, that hurts them, but they need a fairly warm temperature. So that plus the time delay means that it's pretty hard to do aquaponics outside uh, because unless you're really in a really warm climate uh, if you have cold weather and below zero it will kill the bacteria uh, from something like up to 65 degrees the bacteria is growing very slow it's multiplying very slow from 65 and above and I'm talking Fahrenheit right now 65 and above the bacteria grows pretty good. I may have those numbers a little bit off, but it requires warm So That was a problem There's also a problem of how you uh, Remember one of the other things that the plants require They require an anchor to uh, hold them at one particular place so the typical method that people use is that they, for us home users, is that they have a big tray, and that tray should be equal volume to what the fish volume is, the fish tank. They have a big tray, and it's full of rocks, usually rocks. There are other things, but they're more expensive, something called hydro something, um, but it's a, it's a clay material that's formed that basically looks like rocks but it's a lot more porous so it holds more the bacteria and more of the water for the plants roots but most people just use rocks <laughs> and the uh, or gravel and the gravel then the plants roots can form around it and then that causes uh, gives the plant something to anchor to now what happens is that you fill this tray full of water close to being full of water and then the tray then drains once it gets up to the top it drains almost to the bottom and sends that water back toward the fish and then once it drains all the way the nutrients then start filling up that tray again so it's called a fill and drain system that's the most common type that's used for for aquaponics and what that does is by filling it up and then draining it, and with all those rocks right there, that allows the uh, plant roots to get a lot of oxygen because the air is getting trickled around. 
meanwhile you also have to put an air pump in here and uh, pump air for the fish so the fish the fish also require oxygen solid waste is a problem the solid waste if it all gathers at one place there's not going to be any movement of the water or oxygen in the water around where that place is that would kill the worms and it also uh, will cause the kind of bacteria that grows there is a type called anaerobic this type of bacteria here is aerobic aerobic means that it requires oxygen and then the oxygen allows that bacteria to grow to uh, change it into the correct nutrients if you have anaerobic all kinds of crazy things can happen one of them is that it changes the pH of the water another one is that that rotting material uh, as it rots with anaerobic bacteria it can become uh, it can even revert back into uh, ammonia which is deadly for the fish so that's one really big problem there that people have to worry about another reason why I was concerned about trying to do it the biggest one that killed me from doing it was the temperature problem and then the amount of construction time that it would take so what I've ended up doing is just hydroponics hydroponics is basically the nutrients are pumped either in a tray or they're pumped and uh, they're pumped into the plants. The plants, one of the methods I use is that I use what's called beto buckets. The nutrients are pumped into the plants and then the excess part comes back out, goes through a drain system and runs right back into the same uh, reservoir where I had the nutrient solution to begin with. The other method is is a floating what's called a floating raft method and that means that I have a, a tray full of solution and I'm pumping air into it so it's keeping it agitated and it also keeps it aerated which provides a uh, oxygen for those roots again and then by doing that that keeps the plants uh, so that the plants will grow and they're able to get nutrients uh, and then the type of plants I'm growing are fast growing plants using that method and uh, it quickly uh, it doesn't last long enough that basically I just have to put the solution in one time for a, a, a batch of plants and then I uh, drain it all out which I'm just now getting ready to do and then do a next batch of plants so I'm going to show you what I built. So right here, this is my installation of Beto buckets. You see that there's a drain in here. The drain then goes back to this reservoir that's here in the middle of this system. And then this black hose about four times a day it pumps solution back into this and then the solution goes back into this bucket the buckets are full of rocks and then uh, the roots are uh, watered that way and once the time there's a timer on that pump but it's pumping enough that it's getting above this level right here so the excess gets pumped back out and that way it's continually circulating uh, I'm always reusing the same solutions over and over. Okay, what I planted was, I've got 12 buckets on this side. It's 20 foot long. 12 buckets, and uh, I've planted tomatoes in all 12 of those. Trying an experiment where I have some 2-gallon buckets and some 5-gallon buckets. And I'm not real sure how that's going to work out. That's why uh, it's an experiment. So far, they're both growing exactly the same. So I could use nothing but two-gallon buckets. Uh, the uh, plants, as they get larger, and you see I got high hopes. That's about 10 foot up there to the top of that. We'll see if they make it that far. 
Uh, as they grow larger, we'll see how big that root ball gets inside the uh, pot here. It may get so big that uh, it starts becoming root bound and starving itself. So we'll find out at the end of the year or even in another month or so. The other end of that, I'm trying some other different kinds of plants. I've got two pepper plants, bell peppers, two uh, cucumber plants. And they're going to vine up through this, this netting that I'm creating up here. And then I have two uh, really big squashes that I grow. It's a type of winter squash. I call it Godzilla squash because the stuff it grows like crazy. It makes a squash that's about, well, one of them I had was about a foot long, which is a big squash. It looked like a watermelon. And uh, I saved those seeds replanted them, did the same thing again. I kept those seeds, same set, and that's what I planned this year, and it's already grown a bunch. This picture's about a week, a week and a half old, and uh, that Godzilla squash is already up in here. What's its official name? I don't know. I never could find a, the real squash name, but it is a type of winter squash. I guess it's a type of spaghetti squash. But uh, this one is some kind of mutant or something because I've never seen anything that big before. It's called a squash. Tastes good, though. So anyhow, that's the way I'm growing these. That's one type of, of hydroponics. The other type of hydroponics is this type right here. And you see that I did succession planting. Planted this one first. And I'd already ate several out of this This batch. This over here uh, I'm just now starting to cut and eat and I've almost let it get too big. And then this one over here was planted several weeks later. Uh, they're now starting to get big. Uh, I'm probably going to be giving lettuce away to uh, neighbors. This type of lettuce that's growing in here at this one is a type of lettuce that's uh, a type called Romaine, it's a particular type of that, and uh, I had some uh, iceberg lettuce in there, I'd already ate it, and over here I've got a little bit of iceberg growing and some of that romaine also. So I'm getting all green and healthy. Anyhow, that's basically what I've been doing for the last month or so, I've built all these things built the uh, Beto boxes at the other side and I will post a video a couple of videos on my blog about those uh, some links to where I learned how to do all this because there's a guy on the, the net called MHP Gardner and uh, he's the one that does excellent tutorials explaining how to do all of this and uh, it's a really good site. Taught me everything I know. Uh, which probably is not what he'd want to hear. I uh, see also some experiments that I want to try. Probably going to try building some bows over top of this so I can cover this with cloth and or plastic. Maybe make a mini greenhouse out of it to try to extend the season this fall. I also uh, am going to be looking at seeing if I can cool it down a little bit longer in the summer. Uh, we're already approaching 80 degrees in the uh, daytime. I think we've hit 90 once. That's in Fahrenheit again. And uh, that's getting a little warm for lettuce. So we'll see if I can uh, manage to do something to keep it cooler. may not get that done in time this year. But we'll try to have it done by fall so I can see if I can cover it with uh, plastic and make a miniature greenhouse out of these things. So there's uh, lots of experiments coming up. Anyhow, hopefully you got something out of this. You got an idea of how processes can be diagrammed so that you can kind of understand it. Uh, also, you got an idea of how, uh, of how hydroponics and aquaponics and all that works. I will leave you a uh, link in the uh, video notes 
of a really good book if you're interested in aquaponics. Um, there's a really good book that I used that told me a whole lot of what I need to know about aquaponics. And uh, it's very good, very readable. Anyhow, appreciate you listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. This is Gary Fox of Great Making.